we will now discuss external sorting. All of the sorting algorithms we've talked about so far require that the input fits into main memory. Now, that's great and all, but we know that there are some applications out there where the input is just too large to fit everything in the memory. Now, granted, memory has improved a lot over the years where we can put gigabytes and gigabytes of content into our, our RAM, but it's still possible that we have applications where the input is just too large. So we're going to be looking at external sorting algorithms, and these are designed to handle such large inputs where we can't put everything into our memory. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do we need additional sorting algorithms? Can't we just use the internal sorting algorithms? Well, we can, but it's not going to do what we want to do. Most of our internal sorting algorithms take advantage of the fact that our memory it has all these addresses associated with it, which means we can directly access any spot in our memory. Now, let's say we take input that cannot be stored completely in our memory. And let's say it's stored somewhere else, like on a tape. Well, if our input is there, then all these operations are not going to be as efficient anymore. And that's because on a tape, the elements can only be accessed sequentially. If everything's stored in our main memory, we can access any spot in the memory we want. But if we're trying to access elements on a tape, we have to start at the very beginning and run all the way through the input before we get to a specific spot. So every time we're trying to access an element, it's as if we have to start at the very beginning and access the whole thing every single time. So we lose a lot of efficiency. So you might be asking, well, if we can't put it on a tape, why don't we use a disk? Well, even if we do put the data on a disk, we're still going to lose some efficiency and that's because there is delay to spin the disk and move the disk head to read the, the correct spot. Granted, it's faster than trying to read stuff from a tape, but it still takes longer compared to directly accessing a specific address in our main memory. Just as we have a model of computation for our algorithms, we do need a model for our external sorting algorithms. So here we're going to assume that we're working on tapes. And the reason is because tapes are probably the most restrictive storage medium. If we can get an algorithm to work on a tape, then we can get it to work on any external storage device. Now, if we're dealing with tapes, keep in mind that access to an element uh, can only be done by winding the tape to the correct location. We can't just directly access any spot on a tape, which means tapes can be efficiently accessed only in sequential order. So we have to go from the beginning and then wind the tape to the right spot. We can't directly access it. We can't do any other fancy tricks. We can only do a sequential search to find the, the correct spot. For our algorithms, we will assume that we have at least three tape drives to do the sorting. And any algorithm is going to require omega of n squared tape accesses. We'll start by going over a simple algorithm for external sorting. For this algorithm, we're actually going to use the merge sort algorithm. What we'll do is we'll have four different tapes, TA1, TA2, TB1, and TB2. So TA1 and TA2 will be our input tapes, so it'll have the input data. And then TB1 and TB2 will be our output tapes. Uh, we're also going to assume that the data is initially on tape TA1. And we're also going to say that the internal memory can hold and sort M records at a time. The idea is that we're going to read M records from the input tape. We'll then store those records internally since we've assumed that we can hold and sort M records at a time. So we'll put M records in the memory to sort it. And then we're going to write the sorted records alternatively to TB1 and TB2. So we'll take the first M records, put it into TB1. We'll take the next M records and put it into TB2. So we'll call each of each set of sorted records a run. And then whenever we're done, well, we'll just rewind all the tapes and do this stuff again. Let's do an example to help show how this works. Uh, so let's say our values are 
81, 94, 11, 96, 12, 35, 17, 99, 28, 58, 41, 75, 15. The actual values don't matter, but let's just say we have this unsorted set of data. So initially, we would put all of this into TA1. That's our initial input tape. Now let's suppose M equals three, which means that we can store and sort three records at a time in our memory. So if we do all the runs, well, well, we'll get some results. I'll show it in a second, but let me explain what we're doing here. We're going to take the first three records from the tape. We're going to sort them, and then we're going to store them in TB1. We're then going to take the next three records. We'll store that in memory. We'll sort it and then store that in TB2. So those are that's two runs so far. The next run, we'll take the next three records, sort it, and then store it back into TB1. We'll do the next run, which will take three more records. We'll sort them and then store them into TB2, and we just keep doing this. So each time we store stuff in our memory, we sort it and then put it into a tape. We call that a run. So we'll just keep doing that until we get through all of TA1. So our result is going to look something like this. So we see that TB1 has, well, seven items here because we do five runs. The first four runs have three items each. So the first run will store into TB1. The second run stores the first contents into TB2. We then do the third run, which will store three more things into uh, TB1. The fourth run is going to store stuff back into TB2. And then the fifth run just has 15, so we tack it on to the end. And notice with each of these runs, the data is sorted within those particular runs. After we've done this, what we'll do is we'll take the first run from both tapes and then merge them and then we're going to write the complete result in TA1. We'll then do the same thing for the second run from each tape. We'll merge those two sorted lists and then put them into TA2 and we just keep repeating this. So we'll do another set of runs, merge them from the two tapes and put them at the end of TA1. We'll take the next set of runs, merge them, put them into TA2. And we keep doing this until either TB1 or TB2 is empty. And then once one of them is empty, we'll take a look at the other tape and whatever is left there, we just copy it into the appropriate tape. So if we go back to our example, we would get something like this, where we would take the first two runs so one run from TB1 and one run from TB2, and then we would merge them using our merge procedure from the merge sort algorithm, and we would store all that in TA1. We'll then take the second runs from both TB1 and TB2, and then we'll merge those sorted lists and put those into TA2. And then we would see at this point, TB2 is empty, so we take what's left over in TB1, which is just the 15, and tack that on to the end of TA1. We'll now rewind all four tapes and repeat the same steps. Now, what I mean by the same steps, I'm talking about just the merging part. We don't need to worry about putting stuff in our memory anymore and trying to sort it. We're just repeating the whole merging the two sorted lists part. So we'll continue doing this where we'll merge these sorted lists into these tapes until we get one tape that has length n, which would be all of the, the contents from our, our original list. So if we go back to our example, what we're going to do is we'll take the first runs from TA1 and TA2 and we're going to store them into TB1. So we would get something like this. So everything from TA, from the first run from TA1 and the run from TA2, we merge those sorted lists and store everything into TB1. And then sure enough, we still have the 15 left over from the second run in TA1. So that just gets stored in TB2. And then finally, with our example, we would merge everything from TB1 and TB2 back into TA1. So we have two sorted lists, even though one list has, has one item, but we merge all that into a final sorted list. So we would get something like this, where TA1 has the complete sorted list. Now, this particular algorithm requires the ceiling of log of N over M passes. And we also have to include the initial run constructing pass. So if we go back to our example, well, we had 13 items and we said that we could put three items into memory at any point. So what this means is we would need the ceiling of log of 13 over three 
and that turns into three. So we have three passes plus the initial run constructing pass.